let's get going today, you guys. Uh, happy almost Turkey Day. Um, so I thought I would uh, give you guys a, a, a fun discussion. Well, I don't know if it's fun. I hope it's a fun discussion today um, before, in the wake of uh, uh, Thanksgiving. We've been surveying our uh, seafood establishments and looking at food and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I posted a bunch of uh, lectures um, to catch us up on fisheries stuff. And sometimes this can be a little depressing and sometimes people get a little negative. So I thought it's important to also make sure we talk about hope, not fake hope, not baloney hope, not uh, a, a fluff hope, but, but real hope, right? And that's what we're about. We're about uh, seeing our challenges, seeing our problems, and uh, seeing them with wide eyes but not getting totally debilitated by them and going forward and, um, and, and, and solving some problems. And, and we know how to do that. And so uh, sometimes when we, when we focus on the challenges, as you guys are entering, entering the subject, it seems like everything's bad, 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 bad. And I want to make sure you guys understand it's not all bad, 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 bad. So the first uh, story uh, I want to talk about is, um, is, is one that might sort of seem bad, but I think there's lots of positive signals that are coming our way. So this is... Um, with that poor alignment of the 1910, sorry. Um, that is Santa Barbara in about 100 and, 110 or so years ago. And what these guys are standing in are, this is a postcard that was, you could buy and mail around. Um, this is a colorized version of a postcard. Um, and, and look at how many abalone are there. Each of those are about the size of, you know, bigger than those guys' hands or so, right? About the size of their heads-ish, something like that. And there's thousands and thousands of abalone just sitting there. Um, this was uh, what our coastal systems used to uh, be like. Um, this is in my own family. I think I've told some of you guys a story, but my family, when I was young, my family in Northern California, we used to go get uh, you know, food each um, uh, for the year uh, from the intertidal. So we would also get abalone. And it was um, a, a tradition, so the whole family would go up. It was a bunch of different people, and there was different roles. And the, the um, uh, men would go out in the intertidal, sn uh, snorkel, free dive, and pop abalone off of the shallow uh, subtital uh, and bring them up to the kids. And the kids would run them up the cliffs, and the women would be up at the campsite, and they would be prepping the abalone. If you guys haven't eaten abalone, this is... Strange to me, but I know a lot of you guys now haven't eaten abalone. What you're eating is the foot, the muscular hold-on thing part of the animal, right? And usually when we're eating most of our seafood, that's usually what we're eating. We're usually eating the muscle tissue is the main, uh, is the main uh, thing. And so this is a really strong muscle. This is a, a univalve, a one-shelled snail. And they make their living by holding on to rocks really strongly. So if somebody scares them, if a predator comes up, they, they hold on really tight. If they're in a wave crashing area, the way they don't get swept off as the waves are banging on them is they hold on really tight. So they have a very strong muscle. And so uh, you basically cut them out, you slice the, slice the foot off, and then um, you may or may not need to tenderize it. And we would just fry it up and then everybody, there'd be equal portions divided out to each family and we'd take it home for our freezers and that's what we'd have when we wanted, you know, like a, a nice Sunday dinner or something like that. Um, uh, that was my sort of growing up. Um, we have seven different species of abalone native here in California. Um, uh, this is a rough distribution of essentially where they, they most typically are. Uh, quote unquote these days, um, it's un it, it's uh, it's likely that um, these individuals could be deeper than they than they traditionally um, are now, and and there's some other factors that have probably led to their uh, depth stratification. But regardless, um, some things are found pretty high in the intertidal. The highest one would be our black abalone, um, and the the deepest dwelling ones are our whites and our pinks. Um, generally speaking. The guys that are up in the shallower areas um, were, were more in the wave, bang, 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 bang. So they, generally speaking, had stronger muscles. So that translates to when you want to eat them, it's really tough meat when you're looking at the black species. Um, and there's basically a, a, a gradation from the upper right to the lower left with 
um, how tender the muscle is. So the white abalone, you pretty much wouldn't need to tenderize at all. The black abalone, you need to pound it a lot to make it, um, to make it uh, 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 easy to eat and, and fry up or do whatever you're going to do. Um, so this is the distribution roughly, um, uh, uh, sort of generically across California. Um, here are the ranges of where these guys extend. So most of our abalone species extend down into um, uh, Baja California Sur, and they go up at least to Point Conception, and then some species extend the whole length of California, and, and um, uh, pintos go all the way up uh, towards Alaska. Um, but, uh, but basically, yeah, so this is, this is our distribution. Um, these guys have, uh, these are a classic critter like we've been talking about in terms of many of our marine species that have a so-called open population or an open population dynamic uh, going on. They um, have their broadcast spawners. So the male and female release their gametes out in the water column. And so these critters are particular, since they, they don't ro rove around like a fish or, or something like that, right? They're relatively sedentary. Um, they really are dependent on individual, on con specifics, their, their, their reproductive partner being close to them. And that, what does close mean? Close means within a meter or two, right? Really close because as they release their gametes, those, those sperm and eggs get diluted very, very quickly. And so if we're just releasing our eggs out and somebody's 30 meters away from me, there's almost no probability of those, of those individuals getting fertilized, um, for example. So, so um, uh, a really, uh, so we're sort of setting up for potential problems here, right? So we, critters that are relatively easy for humans to get, right? Relatively close to us. Um, uh, uh, tasty and, and high protein, so a valuable thing to eat. Um, uh, they have uh, dense, there's, there's some level of density dependency in terms of their reproductive output. All these things sort of um, perhaps predispose them to maybe being a critter that maybe we would uh, over harvest or over exploit. Um, and so uh, they can be quite big. So you see this guy right here holding a couple you know, Higante, these are like massive, right? These are insanely, insanely large. The, the lore, which is wrong, the lore, which is wrong, is that you count the number of, of excurrent siphon holes, these little holes here where they can blow water out, and that's how old they are. That, that's not right. Um, it is true that the more holes, the older they are, but it doesn't correspond necessarily to a, an annual or a, or a constant rate. Izzy. Uh, the correct way to age them is probably to uh, slice them open and to do a cross section of their shell and look at the layers. Um, so, the, so we have regressions for for um, uh, on average how big they are, but but just by looking at it, it you can guesstimate, but you you can't you can't tell from any external uh, surface uh, their, their age. Um, but I would say these these individuals, um, you know, so an individual that's maybe the size. And again, it's going to depend on food and environment and all this kind of stuff. But roughly, basically, a, an individual the size of your hand is probably on the order of five, six, seven years old, depending on, um, depending on uh, which species we're talking about. It's something like that. And, so, and, and obviously, as with most species, there's a, um, a nonlinear growth rate to these guys. So, so the, I, who knows how old these guys, this guy's holding on? I don't know, 50 years, something like that? You know, sort of long-lived uh, critters. Um, now we've known, so there's been some signaling that there's been um, some uh, issues for a long time. So these are, uh, this, this, was, this uh, article appeared just uh, as WSN was wrapping up in the Monterey Herald, and this is basically about uh, this individual that um, helped discover, helped collect the first white abalone in terms of scientific collecting, and brought it to some... Um, uh, scientists in collected it down south, brought it to uh, some scientists up in Monterey, and they eventually determined it was a new species that became our, our white abalone species. Um, and so this is an effort to to properly name it after this uh, uh, um, fisherman who was Japanese, and at the time. Uh, the guy that got the credit was a white scientist that, that uh, did the naming. Not because not he was trying to do that, but, but the way the institutions of naming worked, um, you name the scientist, not the person. And so there's, there's an effort now with this gentleman's family to, to correct the, the name to properly reflect um, 
the contributions of, of everybody that helped with this. But the point is, we've known for a while there's been some problems. And as you can see right down here, um, which is the general trend, as we've seen with many of our fisheries, not a lot. And you guys saw this also with your uh, fish banks uh, gaming example. So not a lot, not a lot. And then kind of goes up, kind of goes up. And then we, that, that sort of starts to dip or, or doesn't grow. And then we bring another species in. And that goes for a while. That starts to dip. Then we bring another species in. We call that serial depletion, right? We switch from one, re one species or one resource to another, to another, to another, just sort of keep going and, and sort of, you know, keep paying the bills, as it were. But, uh, and then the other, the other pattern is that, you know, things decline as we go through time. So uh, we did not see this on our Central Coast trip because we cannot see this because this is closed and it's now locked. So we can't even sort of sneak in and take a quick peek. Um, this is, uh, for those of us that went on the trip, this is about 10 minutes south of, the, of Rancho Marino. This is in Cayucos. And this is what was known as the, as the worst name, the Abalone Farm. Uh, because uh, it sounds like a great name, but uh, whenever you try to search for the abalone farm, you could never find it in terms of search engines because everything in the world is called the abalone farm. But this was the abalone farm, started in the 60s. And this, uh, farm, this uh, uh, facility farmed red abalone. So you re recall we have seven different species. The main one that people have been farming now is red. And so we've been doing, we, we know how to complete their life cycle in culture. We can um, induce them to uh, spawn. We can get those, uh, we know what little microalgae um, uh, to feed, what phytoplankton to feed the baby villagers at different stages. We know how to induce them to settle, et cetera, and how to feed them. So we can do the, a whole life cycle of uh, red. And so, that, and so that, that's what they grew here. This is a massive facility. This was the largest facility in North America. Uh, for decades, and this was also, uh, so what we call spat, so here we go, here's the adult, here's a little, you know, embryo floating around and everything, and then when they get to about this size, where they just start to settle, little teeny tiny guys, like the tip of a pencil or, or pencil tip to eraser sort of size individuals, um, we call those spat, and those are usually the size that other abalone farms that don't have the ability maybe to go through the whole life cycle, but are trying to culture these individuals, they will buy those propagules. So the abalone farm was also the largest supplier of abalone in North America to other farms. Um, uh, so they were really, really important. Um, uh, this, was, this was created before the Coastal Act. So as a consequence, it, it was relatively easy to start. It is very, very difficult to get aquaculture going uh, in today's uh, um, uh, policy settings in California. So when I started teaching this class, we had about 13, well, I don't know, 13 or 14 different aquaculture facilities in California. Now we're down to about nine or, or maybe even, well, yeah, it might, it, it's starting to change. But, but as of a year or two ago, we were down to about nine. Uh, and so, um, so one of the things is these guys have a seawater system. So this is, if we've been able to see this, this is a flow through seawater system. So this is, again, for those of us that went to um, one of the trip and saw the um, Cal Poly Pier facility, same idea. So we suck water in and have water go once through the whole system. So the water goes through where the, the starfish are and the sea urchins and everything and then flows back out to the sea. Same thing here. So this water would be pumped up right here go up here, this was the rearing facility, and then the water would go down through a series of, of channels, go down, these are all holding pens for adult abalone or, 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 or growing up uh, abalone, and then would be dumped out in the sea. Uh, and so uh, this functioned for a long time. Um, very close, very difficult to um, make ends meet, even though abalone is a relatively expensive thing, you can sell it for a relatively high price, it's still an expense, it's a very labor intensive process. And so um, most of our abalone farms have moved overseas to where labor is much, much cheaper. Um, and so uh, the biggest cost, actually for these guys though, even though labor was huge, the biggest cost, was, anybody want to guess? It, it, labor was huge, but there was another massive cost for them. You're pumping all the water. Yes, exactly. So the electrical demand. So this, there's a big pump that had to run 20, and this is, I don't even, I should know, I don't know the, how many 
tens of thousands of gallons would pump, you know, an hour through this facility. But this is huge sea, seawater pump, 365 days a year, you know, nonstop, always going. And so the electrical demands of the pump were huge. So several times these guys, and so, and for reference, PCH is right over this hill over here. So PCH is just on this, uh, uh, to the right of this image. Um, uh, uh, they, they tried several times to put uh, solar panels here on the, on the hillsides. And also to, they proposed a couple windmills. Uh, the Coastal Commission banned them. Why might you guess the Coastal Commission would not allow uh, solar panels or wind uh, uh, installations here? Oh, okay, maybe, maybe ESHA. Okay, good guess. Maybe, maybe there's some sensitivity uh, going on there, but actually that was not it, but that's a good guess. Is he? Accessibility, good question. No, because this is this is private property. This is this is a a, a family-owned uh, parcel. View shed, view shed. Is that what you say, Stephen? Okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So they said it destroyed the beautiful uh, coastal views. And so unfortunately, that was one of the contributing factors that made it even harder for these folks to stay in business. And during COVID, they basically finally um, shuttered. Um, and so uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this now no longer exists. I mean, the facility's here, but, but the operations no longer exist. However, a consortium has now just come together and, and done a temporary purchase of the lease. So it, it might pop back to life. But, um, but regardless of, so, so this story seems bad, 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 but we do have some success, we, we do have some positive signs here. This is the Monterey Fish Company. Again, this is a place I would have taken uh, the class if PCH had not been closed, if we made it all the way up to Monterey. But um, I, I will uh, share the video with you where you guys can see us going underneath the pier. This is Municipal Pier, municipal pier Number 2 in Monterey. And so this is the end of, uh, you know, a, a working pier. And you can go right here, right today. You guys can walk up right now and buy some abalone if you want from these guys. Or um, you can uh, uh, mail order abalone from them. Uh, and uh, these, these folks uh, have cut a hole. If you walk in here, there's a, a hole cut. And you can go down. I mean, not normally, but with the class you could have. But, but the public can't do this. But you go down through this ladder down underneath into the into these 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 platforms underneath the pier, and they have all their abalone growing in cages there. They harvest local kelp, stuff the kelp in the cages, and uh, and grow their abalone right there uh, underneath the pier. Um, and so you can go ahead and, and get that stuff. And and uh, there's been a a great um, surge now in trying to respond. So our abalone populations have crashed. Let me make sure we're all on the same page. So our abalone populations have crashed. One, over exploitation. So one, we, we took way too many, as you could sort of maybe estimate by my family and or Santa Barbara, we took tons of these critters out of the, out of the sea. So if number one is over exploitation. But in recent years, we've had other threats, and we're seeing this more commonly in a lot of our coastal management issues, especially with biological populations, which is it's assault and then another assault, and then another assault, and then another assault. We see the same thing with disasters. And so um, one is over harvesting. Two, we're seeing issues related to um, uh, uh, changing climate. And one of the, so one changing climate, which is changing their food resources. So we've, we've heard about these heat waves, so-called marine heat waves. The, the famous one about six, seven years ago was called the blob, but the general phenomenon is the ocean water is getting warmer and staying elevated for much longer. We've seen this most dramatically this last summer in Florida with our coral reefs, where it, the water just got insanely hot for an you know, extended period of time. And I, I found out at, at WSN that Florida finally left its heat wave three weeks ago. So the, marine, the aberrant marine heat conditions in the Florida Keys that started in early summer have not, only now we back to sort of background uh, water temperature levels uh, in, those, in those areas. So marine heat waves, and that, that, that makes kelp weaker, and that makes their food source less abundant, so that makes a problem. And then another one, uh, most, uh, most exemplified by um, the black abalone, um, which is uh, 
disease, the spread, either, either the expansion of diseases that used to be here or, and or the introduction or the spread of new um, uh, marine, uh, or not in marine, but just new diseases, right? And so in the case of black abalone, we used to see them, again, when I was in grad school, these would be all over the place in certain areas, greens and blacks. So we'd go to the intertidal out of some of the Channel Islands and there would be, you know, like in our classroom here, there might be, I don't know, depending on where we are, like a thousand abalone, say, in, in the, one of the intertidal bands kind of thing. Now there's very few. And so the issue there was the, the explosion of this rickettsia-like um, disease that basically screwed with, basically messed with the digestion, the ability of the animals to, to eat food. And so essentially it was also called withering foot syndrome because when we'd find these dead individuals, You'd find them in the, in the intertidal, and their foot would look shriveled up. Um, so this, this is an intact foot, and this guy's like trying to grab onto something. He's alive. Um, imagine the foot about half that size and really, really discolored and weak. And so it, it manifests as a weak foot, but really it came from just physiologic, basically starving to death, essentially, what was going on. So um, uh, uh, now we have... Uh, uh, responses to this, right? So we're, we're, we're beginning to see some recovery of some of these populations. We're beginning to see some resistance to some of these, these individuals. And we have pretty active uh, uh, culturing. And there's a, a new wave of folks that are trying to use aquaculture, not just for food production, but maybe we can use aquaculture to help with restoration of these, of these natural populations as well. So maybe we can not just grow abalone for us to eat, maybe we can grow abalone for us to eat and to restock wild populations uh, out and about. So this is very new. Um, and this is, a, this is uh, these next uh, couple pictures here are just some slides from uh, a, a symposium at WSN. But basically the point here is, I, and I think we're, we're touching on this with our seafood surveys, right? Which is um, uh, uh, getting food is costly, right? Getting food is, is uh, that it comes with a cost. And so um, we've, for the last few decades, sort of been under an illusion that, that uh, you know, hey, we can get all this cheap stuff, these Twinkies, this, this whatever this stuff is really easy at the supermarket, and there's not much cost to us. It's affordable, et cetera. Um, the reality is food can be affordable, but, but there are costs to be paid. And so with some of this new effort about mariculture and aquaculture, we're trying to figure out if we can... Um, uh, interject more sustainability throughout the entire process. And so this idea of growing food and propagules to put out and about is, is one example of that. And so while this stuff has sort of really taken off with abalone um, and oysters, um, there's now other ideas which maybe we can use this to recover other overexploited uh, species that maybe we thought a few years ago that would be impossible. But for example, pismo clams. Pismo clams, another really important fishery. Um, that uh, everybody used to walk, be able to walk out in our sandy beaches right here and, 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 and shovel up some clams and go have a, have a, a soup or a, a clam bake or whatever. Um, we've we've over-harvested those populations as well. That fishery, the abalone fishery, the abalone fishery south of Point Conception has been closed. So the, ab the abalone fishery south of Point Conception was a scuba-based harvest. So you could get, you put your scuba tank on and go get abalone. The harvesting north of uh, Point Conception is on free dive, is with free diving. Since 1997, um, essentially all harvesting of abalone south of Point Conception has been closed because the populations are, are too low. You can still harvest in Northern California, um, but only, only uh, certain populations, et cetera, um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's relatively limited. Um, uh, the same is for pismo clams. So pismo clams, the, the fishery has been shut down for several years, but we're starting to see signs. These are average signs. We're starting to see signs of recovery of these critters, which is cool. And we're starting to see a movement for, um, and th this was uh, actually during uh, WSN, two week, you know, the other weekend, and so unfortunately couldn't go check this out, but this is really cool. So this is a... Um, uh, sustainable seafood festival, not in Malibu, which they should be in Malibu and Santa Monica and, and Oxnard and all those great places, but this is in South Central. So this is in a community not at the beach, right? Not necessarily typically associated with seafood. 
but trying to talk to people about the value of healthy, affordable seafood and the benefits of eating, um, you know, uh, 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 seafood and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so cool stuff is happening, and and this is ha and this stuff is happening because we're responding to one of our stressors, right? We're responding to the over harvesting, and we haven't given up. We've said, hey, maybe there's some other approaches. We can limit some of the wild population extraction, and we can encourage the growth of these individuals and other systems. And now that we've figured this out, maybe this is a cool tool we can apply. So the notion that everything is doom and gloom and it's all over is totally uh, wrong, I would suggest. I'd also say there's all kinds of other examples of successes that we've had in terms of coastal. Does that make sense? I'm kind of going fast here, but, but any, any abalone questions? For I'm going to pivot away from abalone now. Yeah, Stephen. No. Um, white ab where are we? White abalone. Here, let's go here. White abalone are our first marine invertebrate that went on the endangered species list. So white abalone are endangered. Whites and pinks are endangered. These other guys are not endangered. There, there's there's some talk of listing black abs as as endangered. But um, the rest of these guys are very low, but they're not, they're not technically endangered. So the ones were mostly, har historically, the ones in recent decades, people mostly have harvested greens and reds. Um, and so the, when people, har right now, if you and I go up to Northern California and we go to uh, harvest an abalone, we'll get a red abalone is what we'll get. Yeah, sorry, maybe I didn't make that clear. Cool? All right. Um, okay, so the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that we have, we do have successes, right? We have successes. So, um, coastal water quality. Um, I, I didn't give you guys my, my sort of somewhat gross lecture on, uh, <laughs> on coastal water quality, but um, back in 100 years ago, um, the, what we would call, what we now call Baywatch, the lifeguards, in Santa Monica and in Venice and in the, in, the, in the greater Santa Monica Bay, they would get really, really nasty. They get cholera from jumping in the water to save people. Um, so we're talking raw sewage flow of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people a day, raw sewage going out into um, Santa Monica Bay. And the same thing was in many areas. Um, that was a huge problem. As we start to do more sanitary treatment of waste into the 30s and 40s and 50s, we still were pumping out huge amounts of nutrients from our sewage treatment plants into the coastal zone. One of the things this led to was a massive bloom of phytoplankton, right? Just, just we're, we're, we're fertilizing the nearshore ocean. And that sedimentation from bad uh, coastal management practices, sedimentation and nutrients basically meant our kelp was fading, our kelp was disappearing, um, just because light simply couldn't get to the bottom. And so it was, it was dark. Instead of being a high light environment, it was a shade, in effect a shaded environment. And so by cleaning up a lot of our discharge, point source discharge, especially from our sewage treatment plants, um, uh, and working on better uh, sediment management practices, um, we've seen uh, the water quality improve to the point where kelp was, was coming back and, all, and, and doing all that great stuff. So we do know how to do some of this stuff. Kelp is currently getting hurt again because of these um, um, uh, marine heat waves, but, but the point is we were able to clear, clean up a lot of coastal water quality. Is coastal water quality perfect? Do we still have pollution out there? Yes. Do we still have problems? Yes. But compared to where we've been over the past few decades, it's awesome. It's gotten much, much better. So just because we're not perfect, do not take away from that that we have not, we've made zero progress. We've done a lot of good things, especially here in Southern California. Another great example of success is the management of a global pollutant. That would be our ozone hole. So again, I think I've told some of you guys a story, but when I was your, in your place, the thing that was going to end the world was the ozone hole, right, which is growing, growing, growing. And it's not, we call it the ozone hole. It's more of a thinning of atmosphere, stratospheric ozone, right? It's not, it's not a quote unquote hole. It's just a, a massive reduction. And, uh, and talk about utter collapse of surface ecosystems in, um, in Antarctica with a massive increase in UV rays because we wouldn't have the ozone hole to protect those critters and all kinds of problems and everything. Um, we came together and with the Montreal Protocol, 
voluntarily with these countries across the world, we agreed to um, uh, stop and or phase out the chlorofluorocarbons and halogenated compounds, different things that impact our um, ozone hole. And the ozone hole is recovering. It's still, it's still being impacted from those decades of our releasing of these very long-lived chemicals into the atmosphere, but it is recovering. And so that's a success story, right? Nobody was forced anybody to do it. All these other countries had to work together and it worked, right? So we, we do have models for successful collaboration, even on very uh, wicked problems like that. Uh, in terms of combating invasive species, we still have invasive species. They're still a major threat. They're still causing all kinds of problems. But we do have protocols now to deal with things like ballast water and stuff of that nature. So we're, 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 getting, uh, we're doing well. Um, the California Coastal Act, for all the problems that the Coastal Act says, like, oh, you can't build any uh, solar panels because people might see them, you know, all those kind of things and all the frustrations, um, it's still, I would argue, on average, been a, a massive positive for our state and has led to or helped us avoid some of the worst of the potential development pressures that were going on. We'll talk about one of those in a second. And I would say another example of successes is a lot of our uh, fisheries here in California, even though we don't talk about them, they are recovering. They are recovering, and that, that's a success. Um, the other thing is, uh, is the things we've been talking about all semester, right? The coast really is real, this idea of the coast, of, of different behaviors of people and, and, and economies and things at the sh at, you know, proximate to the sea versus far in from the sea. Um, and we, we went through this, went through this, went through this. Um, uh, generally speaking, we know what to do with the coast. And even though the coast is, is harder in some senses than our other areas for the reasons we've talked about, because we're, everybody's concentrated in this relatively narrow area, everybody wants to be here, the resources are focused here, we have a line um, of the land touching the um, water, right, all that kind of stuff, we generally actually know what to do. And we have examples of how to fix stuff. So for example, here is Surfer's Point. We, this, this is a, a case study that people use across the country, right, as an example of how to do managed retreat appropriately and in a way that, that brings multiple benefits for different communities, et cetera. Um, and again, uh, our coast has improved, right? So this is um, Huntington Beach um, about 100 years ago. Um, I would say uh, we still have active oil extraction, but not the same intensity. Um, and we have uh, lots of people going to the beach uh, still and using our coastal resources still. Um, coastal access uh, is, is an ongoing issue with the Coastal Act. We've seen lots of, uh, for as, as problematic as that can be, um, nevertheless, the access points we have preserved are because of the Coastal Act. And one great example was last night. So last night in our uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy meeting, um, uh, this happened. So this is a proposal. So th this is this yellow thing you see here is the Coastal Slope Trail. This is a public access trail for folks to be able to walk um, uh, you know, from Santa Monica to, to Point Magoo. Um, much of this is already built and completed and installed, but not the whole thing. So you cannot, as of, as of today, you cannot go to Santa Monica and start to walk towards us in Ventura County and be able to walk on this trail. Why? Because some of this trail crosses private property and those people are like, no, I don't want a trail on my, on my land. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've had in recent years to, um, to, to managing uh, uh, coastal landscapes, et cetera, has been this area, which is now called the Sweetwater Mesa area. Um, but this is the, uh, the property that was purchased by um, The Edge from U2. And so purchased a, a big parcel and wanted to put a big recording studio up there. The problem is uh, when this land was purchased, there was no road up. So, so, they, so the land was acquired on this sort of coastal bluff uh, you know, overlooking Malibu, but there's, no, there's a fire road, but there's no, there's no um, you know, uh, uh, kind of easily accessible road. So this went on for several years. 
um, it's still ongoing, but but it was going on for several years. And the basic idea was they wanted to, in addition to, to putting all this development in, put in a huge amount of infrastructure of over a mile of road that would essentially open up all this, the rest of this area to other development, right? And so this went through all kinds of things. And so, so then it wasn't, then it wasn't going to be um, a recording studio. It was going to be five bungalows, and there were going to be five things. And then it was, then they were going to be super sustainable, and they hired the greenest green designer, and this was going to be an eco, eco village and all this kind of stuff. The, but regardless, the point was always, hey, let us develop this and let us open up this other chunk of the coast to development, which would almost invariably lead to additional development and, and fragmentation, et cetera. Um, is, is, has anybody here heard, heard this story in their land use class or other classes? Has anybody talked about this? Okay. So, um, okay, so this is, within, this is within the coastal zone. So we know they'd have to get a coastal development permit, right, to do this. They, they have to go through the county and all the, the building codes and everything, but they also have to get permission from the coastal commission to do this uh, development. So the Coastal Commission is the main entity determining you know, what's going on. However, other folks can have say. And so uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy has a lot of sway, right? So Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy does, does not have veto power, you know, doesn't, you know, because they, they don't have a direct ru ruling in here. But um, they, uh, I should say, we, uh, wrote a letter saying we did not support this particular development. Uh, this is very contentious. This was, this was a gazillion million high-powered lawyers, and you can imagine people with really, really deep pockets. Um, and so uh, they came back to us, and they said, hey, we know that coastal access is really important to you all, and you want to have the public be able to access the coast. And the answer was, yes. And the answer was, if you drop your opposition, so I didn't say we had to support this development, but if we simply drop our opposition to the development, perhaps there would be some land that would be made available to you that you could, that you could either get for free or be allowed to purchase. Not just this, not just this part of the coastal trail, but these other parts that we know the people, okay, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, right? So I'm not speaking as a, as a public person or whatever, right? I'm just speaking as a scientist. So um, people that hate you, people that don't like your organization, people that, that don't want you around at all. And so there's no way in a million years they're ever gonna sell you their property. So you'll never ever be able to, to um, complete the Coastal Slope Trail, but if you drop your opposition, we guarantee that they, they'll uh, be willing sellers, right? So, so really, really sophisticated approach, right? Really sophisticated approach. So, so a really smart landowner understanding what the public agency was trying to, uh, you know, ultimate goals were, um, but sort of a Hobbesian bargain, right? So, um, uh, uh, I won't tell you how I voted, I'll just say that the, um, the conservancy opted to drop our opposition in the most contentious hearing I've ever been associated with in 20 years. It was, it was an extremely close vote. It was like one or two votes. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a very divided um, group. Normally these types of boards almost always act in unison or almost you know, near unanimity. This was a very hard thing. And so, anyway, so long story short, uh, that, uh, uh, the, they eventually secured their coastal development permit, so the Coastal Commission allowed them to go ahead, but they hit other roadblocks, um, which, which uh, we, we don't have time to go into right now, hit other roadblocks, and it's not been developed. So last night at the Santa Monica Conservancy, uh, we had a presentation for these chunks of parcels. This is not in it yet. This is a few weeks away. But these two parcels over here, which include um, parts of the Costa Slope Trail, we voted to allocate $10 million to buy 150 acres that includes these two parcels. And um, while we can't, shouldn't put the cart in front of the horse, there's 
a decent chance that this parcel and this parcel will also be made available in the next few weeks. So we've gone from something that looked like a massive, you know, incredibly deep pockets, very sophisticated landowner, really wanted to develop this chunk of the coast um, and, and fragment this part of the coast, to 10 years later, um, uh, it looks like there's a decent chance that this will get turned over to full public control, right, and, and, and public access. So that's, that's a victory. It looks dark, right? It might, it might at the time look like, oh my God, we're never going to be able to do this or we're always going to lose or this is pessimistic. But I'd say coastal access actually on the long term is winning, even though it seems like we have some difficult battles ahead. Can cool. Build a road still? No. Uh, no. No road. Um, so, so the, the smart lawyers said we would get access to that if they're allowed to build. So uh, they didn't build, so, so that never really manifested. But I would say that, uh, uh, yeah, so that was sort of like one chapter. This is sort of a new chapter that's just opened up in recent uh, years. Oh yes, it's going to be, uh, well, okay, so, okay, so what we voted on last night was $10 million because the decision needs to be made by the end of December. So in this case, uh, so we're not privy to all the details, but okay, so how these public land acquisitions go, um, uh, uh, you have an appraiser, like the public agency has an appraiser, the landowner has an appraiser, or several. And they go and they, they say, fair market value is X. And they, and they, you know, your guy has the estimate, my guy has the estimate, and then we come to some agreement. And so, and so the appraisers say, okay, yes, it's worth whatever millions of dollars for this many acres, right? And so that's happened. Um, as to the actual negotiation, so, 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 so that's sort of agreed upon. But as to the actual negotiation with the agency, that's not public, right? Because because if everybody, if, if it was all public that I was saying, hey, I'm going to give you $5 million, the next guy would go, oh, I'm going to give you six, right? So, so then we, don't, we don't know the negotiations until they're over because they happen what's called closed session. So it's not a public, uh, it's a public agency with lawyers, uh, but it's not publicly available. Um, that's, still go, that's, still under, that, that's still going on. But the motivation here is the end of, <clears throat> as often as the case, an end of the year tax lawyer thing. So the owners have some reason that they, uh, uh, avoiding taxes isn't the right way to say it, but, but they, 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 have, they want to get some credit for the amount of taxes they have to pay. And so that's why they're trying to do this by, the, by this end of the year time frame. So we'll know in a few weeks what happened to this story. Um, and it also, it also will probably set up the, the other parcels also getting acquired. But, but the thing we voted on last night was for uh, just this first little, the, 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 these first couple chunks here, that would be the first sort of, of, I wouldn't say dominoes, but potentially the first dominoes. And then these other things may well follow in succession. Uh, but to answer the question, usually it's multiple, with, with this expensive stuff, it's usually multiple agencies. So the Trust for Public Lands, or the Wildlife uh, Board of California, other, other entities, Sometimes, sometimes organizations like the Nature Conservancy, um, uh, sometimes agency, federal agencies like the National Park System, we would come together and sort of have some agreement and, and sort of divide the costs so that it's not like one agency has to buy this or one group, even though ultimately it might be one group that man, maybe the Park Service or somebody that might manage it or MRCA that might manage it. Um, there oftentimes are many players in the acquisition phase. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Okay, so, no. Okay, so let me explain. So this is, um, so if the owner wants, so, so say the person that owns Plot Red, right, the, the Sweetwater Mesa, they, it's their property. They can do whatever the heck they want with it, right? They could say, hey, LA Times, do a story on this. I want to raise a gazillion million dollars, right? 
Like put, put me in hot property or whatever they call that stuff, right? Um, or could just list it on Zillow or a major listing service or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is um, these folks knowing that a land management agency would like this. And, um, and so uh, years of talking back and forth, right? And saying, hey, if you ever do sell this, talk to us first, right? And so if the, how do I say this? If the people really don't want to do conservation, they would say, yeah, thanks, I'm not talking to you, right? And then it would be on the open market, at which point an agency could bid on it just like you could. That almost never happens. Because then, then it's like we don't, the agencies don't have the ability to kind of like, oh, you're going to uh, bid a million dollars? I'm going to bid two million. You're going to bid three. It doesn't really, like we have to get all the finances and we can only pay fair market price. Whereas you might pay another $500,000 over to get a house, right? Because you want the house. Agencies aren't allowed to do that. They can only pay the, the appraised cost. Um, however, in these kind of situations, it's usually someone that has some interest. Like, well, you know, my family grew up here and it's a beautiful piece of property. I would hate, you know, I, I kind of like it to be, you know, stay the way it is or something like that, right? Um, and, and then in some cases like this, there's also maybe a time issue where they, wanna, it, they want some tax um, benefit by a certain time window, and so they want a, a guaranteed sell kind of thing. Um, and then there are other things. So if there were a lien on this, if this person had a piece of property that they had a bill they didn't pay or a tax, something they didn't pay or something, um, then it could be that uh, an agency might have the first, what's called first right of refusal. So they might, they might be the first one at the trough to, to sort of start to bid on it, but that's not the case with this one. Cool?